Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Okay, go in your Bibles this morning to Psalms or psalm. The New Living calls it psalm. I don't like that. I like psalms. There's more than one of them. Amen. Praise God. I guess when you name each chapter, it is a psalm. We're going to 106 today. You should have read this chapter in the last couple of days or today. I don't remember, but Psalms 106. And I was working for a couple of weeks on some thoughts for today, and this captured those thoughts pretty well. One verse to begin this morning, Psalm 106, or Psalms 106, and we're looking at verse 34. Israel failed to destroy the nations in the land as the Lord had commanded them. I want to talk to you today about the land, or our land, and our liberty. Our land and our liberty. We, um, we're not a perfect nation. We haven't had a perfect history. I uh, saw some headlines the other day where somebody who had left North Korea alive and is now in America, and they were commenting on some of the social issues that we've struggled with over the last few years and mentioned, this person mentioned, that they don't enjoy the benefit of struggling over those kinds of things in countries like North Korea. Because if you don't agree to the goodness of the country, whether you think it's good or not, if you don't agree to the goodness of the country and the good history of the country, you're no longer a part of the country. And you don't leave by getting on an airplane. Right? Yeah, you leave by way of the grave. But we are so fortunate in America that in spite of our mistakes of the past, our errors along the journey, that we're a country that can be corrected. We can improve. We can always, and that, that alone deserves celebration. Amen? Praise God that here you have a voice and you can advocate for change. And even if others don't agree with you, you can sell your position, you can convince people, you can preach if you want to. And uh, we certainly live in a time now where there are more preaching from other texts, other convictions than those biblical texts and convictions. That's our issue. And so many, I was talking to an older gentleman the other day who does not attend here, but he lives in our community and attends another church. And uh, I was at the funeral home and he said, I I just never in my life have I been so ready to leave this life. I just don't recognize anything. And I understand that. But what we find here in Psalm 106 is this difficult realization that Israel had been given so much, and yet they squandered it, and in some ways without even knowing how they had squandered it. And so the author of Psalm 106 begins to help us understand what happened. They failed to destroy the nations in the land. Now, of course, when we talk about these kinds of things, we're not talking literally, right? We're not talking about people, flesh and blood. We're talking about spiritual things. And we're talking about 
the fact that you and I have to understand what the land is. What, what is God's promised land for that? And I think you would agree, today at least for the sake of this message, we're going to simplify it by saying our land is arriving, us arriving at righteousness in the Lord and liking it once we get there. Many of you would testify that when you got saved, something powerful happened in your life. Transformation took place. For me, it was when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And others of you, you may have that testimony. But for all of us, we know that God visited us and something changed. Something took place that made us different than we were before. It didn't happen outwardly. There may have been evidence of that, but it happened inwardly, and our position changed. Now, the difficulty that we've learned since then is that we have to love where we now live. And the longer you're on this journey, the further you go on this road, the more you see the attractions of the world around our little phones and their smartness and our cars and their ability to drive by themselves. I'm just waiting for the day when a little airplane will come to my house in my yard and pick me up and take me to the big airport so I don't have to drive those two hours and deal with parking and all of that. We're waiting for that because this world is so fantastic that we little by little begin to say what's so bad about here. So our land is arriving at a place of righteousness, holiness, godliness, whatever you want to call it, and then learning to like it. Because if you and I are going to do that, if we're going to learn to like what God's life for us is, we can only do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. Your flesh will never like righteousness. Your flesh, your, your inner uh, desire to have those things uh, around us, never will your flesh say, hey, you know what? This God stuff is really great. Let's go after more. Your flesh will never say, by the way, let's fast this week. By the way, let's pray for a couple hours today. Let's read two books in the Bible. Let's go to prayer meeting. Your, your flesh will never do those kinds of things because the flesh says, you may have found God, but I don't like it. So what we read in the Bible is that Israel failed to destroy the nations in the land as the Lord had commanded them. Now, there, there's a reason that God commands us. We don't always know the reason. But when you come into this land, there are always things that have to be destroyed. It's a journey. God expected them to accomplish some of it instantly, other as they journeyed through. You can't take the northern land if you're positioned down in the south. Take the land where you are, God will lead you on. Some people back in the day used to testify of being delivered from cigarettes. That was a long time. I meant to bring it out here. Oh, I have, uh, somebody gave me, I think Sister Beanie, some old newspaper clippings and, and um, tracks and different things from our church from a long time ago. And one of them, I, I wanted to have it out here to read it to you because you will groan inside to hear me read it today. The things that they preached against, oh, they preached it hard. And it was signed, the Christ Ambassadors of Central Assembly. That was the youth group back then, the youth ministry back in the day. And I'm going to tell you what, they preached heaven high and hard to get there. They preached hell hot and open wide to receive everyone. And I'm telling you, they lit it up on cigarettes, and they really went hard after the women smoking. Woo! And filthy, dirty. People would testify to being delivered from those kinds of things because they had met Jesus. So as they were going into this land of living for the Lord, they were testifying of being delivered of things. And that's what I want you to, uh, to understand as we read this verse. Driving things out, not by your own power, but by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's nothing wrong with saying the Lord is in my life, I'm going to lay this down. That, that's a testimony. That's an offering that you've surrendered. But others had the testimony, I left church, was driving home, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, don't touch them again, and I threw them out the window. Don't do that, all right? Um, 
throw them in the trash when you get in the garage or home, all right? Because I have to walk where you drive. But how many of you, let me, come on, let me see your hands. You knew somebody that had that testimony. You, 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 wow, we're far removed from our old days, aren't we? <laughs> that's, that's living in the land and driving out the enemy. Well, let's take a look at some of this. I, I want to I compare this to our revolution, the American Revolutionary War. Here's some interesting facts that I checked out. We celebrate the 4th of July, the article says, as a unifying victory for the country. But the road to independence was more divisive and violent than most people realize. According to Thomas Slaughter, the Arthur R. R. Miller Professor of History at, uh, I think it's um, Rochester, University of Rochester, or Rochester University, it doesn't say here, but I think that's where. And he's the author of the 2014 book, Independence, the tangled roots of the American Revolution. Here's some things that he mentions in his book. At no time, at no time, did more than 45% of America's colonists, those who lived here at that time, no more than 45% supported the war at any given time. <laughs> how, how many of you today support the, Revo- the American Revolutionary War. How many of you say, well, thank God, right? I, it, we'd all be speaking with that crazy British accent. And, <laughs> it, it, and listen, there were a lot of bad things and good things and whatnot, but today we all say, whoa, wow, hey, praise God, we, we won the Revolutionary War. But during that time, n- never did more than 45% of those who lived here support the war, and at least a third of those who lived here fought for the British. So when people tell you, uh, I'd like to go to church, but I just don't like all that church politics and that fighting at church, yeah, well, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, does it? (laughs) A third of the people living here fought. That means... That even though we speak of the civil war as brother against brother, this was literally the nation divided. Neighbor fighting neighbor. It had to be a a horrible, horrible time. Americans, he says, Americans were not only rebelling against the mother country, they were fighting each other. Second of all, a higher percentage of the population died in the American Revolution than in any other war fought by Americans. As a result, more people who lived through the American Revolution knew someone who died or lost someone in the war than in any war we have fought since. The percentage, the percentage, those who died compared to those who lived here in total. No other war had a higher percentage of the population dead in the war. That's pretty significant. And so people, everyone knew someone who had died or had personally lost a relative. In battle, when we read what we read in the Psalms, and we talk about our battle with the flesh, our battle with this world, and our battle with the, the enemy, Satan, we have to understand that it's not as clear it's not as, as, as easy to understand as just saying, well, you've got to fight the flesh. It's complex. It's difficult. Catch this one, number three. Many Americans switched allegiance and changed signs, the, the banner, during the revolution depending on which side was winning. For example, at one inn along a well-traveled road in New Jersey, what is today Route 1, The innkeeper would send a servant out to look down the road every morning and throughout the day. If an army was spotted, the servant was charged with identifying the colors and raising the corresponding flag to keep soldiers from burning down the inn. (laughs) So uh, we've picked our side. It's whichever side's winning today. See, that can't happen in your battle with faith. You can't say, I'm on the Lord's side today and I'm in the world tomorrow. That creates conflict in your soul from which it can be very difficult to be rescued. All of us go through that at times, but you can't make up your mind you're going to live that way. In the end, that's no life. 
Jesus said, don't be lukewarm. It'd be better be hot or cold. So let's take a look at the rest of the psalm here this morning before we run out of time. Go to verse 35. We're in Psalms 106. Instead, the people of God, instead of destroying the nations in the land, now notice he didn't say on day one or within a week. It wasn't about the time. It was about the accomplishment. Instead, they mingled among the pagans and adopted their evil customs. They worshipped their idols, which led to their downfall. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. Number one, if we are going to have liberty, we must identify idols. This is, I believe, one of the most significant callings of every believer. Every follower of Jesus Christ must identify idols. Now, I don't need you to identify the idols in China or Japan. I don't need you to identify the idols across the continent of Africa and Europe. I need you and God needs me to identify the idols in America and specifically those ones with which I struggle. John said it best when he closed out his first letter and said, My children, keep yourselves free from idols. Yeah, the author that we most assign an affinity to the church, John the Apostle, he was always concerned about the church, always understanding the vulnerability of the church. And he closes that, that letter out by saying, keep yourselves spotless, I think the King James says, from idols. These things have an appeal to us. And when you look at it here, there are four places in the Old Testament in the King James where the word demon is used, and this is one of those four. What's interesting, I think, is just like in the New Testament, there's never an explanation as to where they come from, but every human being understands them. You may not be able to explain them, but it is a given. In America, there are figures of speech, even among the unbelievers. Well, he was never able to overcome his demons. Well, she struggles with some of those demons. And by that, they simply mean that there are things to which that person has given themselves or struggles, but they don't necessarily mean anything spiritually. For you as a believer, you understand that it's not just some unseen, invisible force, but it literally is a spiritual assignment. And these things operate in such a way that you and I can never be sure of what's going on or how to win apart from the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I told you a few weeks ago, I spent point number one talking about that phrase in 1 Corinthians 7 where Paul says, because there is so much sexual immorality today. And I want to I hit on that again because I, I feel like the Spirit of God is leading me to touch on this again and again and again because in our nation, we, we somehow got sideways back in the, people would say the 70s, I think it goes back probably to years, decades before that, but people began to perceive a type of freedom that the Bible doesn't describe. And that freedom was to throw off all restraints associated with what they felt was religion, to throw off all conviction, to walk in a new life they considered to be one of enlightenment, a progressive life. And so outwardly, there were all of these new freedoms. There were all of these encouragements to do this and do that. And behind the scenes, what we didn't know was just how many children were being abused. The Boy Scouts settled this week. Did you see that? $850 million, much of which will go to attorneys, unfortunately. But they settled. They didn't settle because they didn't teach boys how to make a campfire. It wasn't a settlement over failing to show young people how to survive in the wilderness if they were ever lost there. It was a settlement, a legal settlement, that was supposed to represent forgiveness and healing, acknowledgement, reconciliation with the past. Because untold thousands of those boys who are now men, yeah. 
I was reading about a gentleman this week. I, I thought he had passed away. I didn't remember exactly when. He was a well-known minister. I, I don't know that he would even take that label. He got saved in San Francisco in the 1960s or 70s. I don't remember which. He went on to begin a, a, an outreach to men across that city, eventually across our nation and around the world. An outreach to men who had been deceived, who had been abused and recruited into this new freedom called same-gender attraction or homosexuality. I, I won't share his name with you. You can look him up. He became really well-known, wrote a powerful book, was considered to be the father of the ex-homosexual movement, those coming out, that, that movement which is now under such constant fire. Uh, it's, it's considered to be uh, against the nature of man to try to bring anybody out of that walk because nobody can change, right? Although now all the kids seem to need surgery to change them. But... Um, this man, the testimonies I read about him, and I have one of his books. It's just outstanding. It's called a, I think it's called uh, A Journey Out of Homosexuality, and you can, you can look it up. It's still available. This man, the, the, even his critics considered him to be one of the most godly people they'd ever met. Do you know what his story was? In church, as a 12 13-year-old boy, in church, in church, the pastor recognized an opportunity. The pastor began to plant seeds of suspicion in this young guy's life. Then this young guy's dad passed away made him even more susceptible, looking for leadership, looking for somebody to, to show him what it was to be a man. And this guy continued, the pastor continued, the pastor supposedly, continued to put suggestions in him until one day he said, I believe God has made you homosexual to a 13-year-old. Hmm. And that suggestion alone sent him out into a decade of a life lived sideways until one day, ready to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, he heard a voice say, if you're going to give up your life, give it to me. I'm going to tell you how you know something's demonic. You will almost never see something spiritually or necessarily even with your eyes. I'm going to tell you how so you'll know something is demonic, satanic, because it will promise you things that you know it's incapable, incapable of delivering. It will bring to you suggestions that make you feel uncomfortable in some part, maybe not every part, but in some part of your being. You'll know it's demonic because if you look at it in the lives of others, you'll see eventual destruction. You'll You'll see things that come with that that you don't want. But there will be an appeal. Some part of it, something about it will appeal to you. It will speak to you in a language that you feel soothed and comforted by. But I'm going to tell you something. There's also a part of you called your conscience. And your conscience will say something does not feel right. Something does not look right. Something does not sound right. It may have all the right traits. It may really pull you in some direction, but it's demonic when you know deep inside, hey, this doesn't seem like the right deal. You also know it's demonic because it will eventually ask for your worship. They, they even sacrifice their sons and their daughters. If we're going to have a revival in America, if we're going to have something of God happen, it's going to take today a revolution. It's going to take the same kind of conviction that those 30 or 40 percent had back in 1775 and 6. It's going to take a commitment. We might be the minority as spirit-filled believers. We might not even have a national voice politically or culturally anymore. Hallelujah, we don't need it. But what it's going 
going to take is us recognizing that we have sacrificed two generations of kids to the demons around us and to simply say, I don't know everything about spiritual warfare. I don't even know where the demons come from. But I know a demon when I see the results. And I'm coming to tell you there is a way out. There is a way to lay that thing down. you got to lay down the idol and say, I don't want anything to do with you. You know, most of the people that we read about in the New Testament that were delivered, there was never any indication that they had been set free. They met Jesus, and that was it. We have the stories of some rare occasions where meeting Jesus required even more because the demon was so strong, the demonic presence so powerful that to get to Jesus, that thing had to be broken visibly. That's very rare. 99 plus percent of people never have to have that experience. And for those who do, it's powerful. This is impossible without the power of the Holy Spirit, but this is what we're called to. Idolatry in any form is the invitation of demons. Here's the second thing. Go to 41. We're going to skip part of how bad it got, but 41. He handed them over to pagan nations, and they were ruled by those who hated them. Their enemies crushed them and brought them under their cruel power. This kind of stuff will always tell you. These kinds of sins will always say to us, I love you, I love you, I love you. But the truth is, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. Isn't that amazing that it says right here that their captors hated them? They were ruled by those who hated them. I read stories every once in a while. Somebody was in a gang because they wanted to feel loved. They got in the gang to feel loved. Their enemies crushed them and brought them under their cruel power. And again, again and again, he rescued them. Oh, hallelujah. Again and again, he rescued them, but they chose to rebel against him, and they were finally destroyed by their sin. Even so, he pitied them in their distress and listened to their cries. He remembered his covenant with them and relented because of his unfailing love. Glory to God. Number one, identifying idols. Number two, covenant keeping. There is something powerful about understanding the covenant so that when you read this, it says to you and I, no matter how crushing that idol has been to us, no matter how destructive that sin, God is going to relent. He is going to say, you've you've had enough. Come home. Come on. Come back. The good news is that God is always in the deliverance business. The good news is the blood of Jesus cannot be stopped. The good news is that the blood breaks every chain, sets every captive free. It's not just for the one who's out on drugs, out in sin. It's for the believer who has been struggling with some demonic issue and the blood of Jesus is still available for you and I. Hallelujah. That's the good news. Come on. We don't have to have 80% of the population on our side. All we have to say is, Lord, we may be a remnant. We may be a few. But we believe our nation needs to be reminded of your covenant-keeping nature. I love this. He remembered his covenant with them and relented because of his unfailing love. It kind of helps you to understand that everything is under God's control. Everything. Amen? There were guys who were leading the revolution. Imperfect, no doubt. Easy to look back now and criticize them for areas in their lives that weren't what we would call complete or informed. Much more difficult to live back then. Several of General George Washington's letters show that at different times, Congress, Continental Congress lost confidence in him and wanted to remove him. His own generals lost confidence in him and tried to have him removed. It was a time when you really never were sure who was who and what was what. But some of those guys, including Mr. Washington, kept the conviction that God was leading them. 
You and I may not know the details of life, and I get a little bit concerned when a lot of believers have seen something online and suddenly they feel like they know or they're an expert. Listen, there are a lot of things in this life we just can't know. Even if somebody explains it, shows us a video, how do we know that video wasn't doctored or made up? We don't. All we can do is remain confident that God is with us. Amen? If you don't know anything, I challenge you to know Jesus Christ and stay anchored in him. Hold on because he's covenant. He will never break the covenant. You might go over here, over there, struggle this way, that way. But when you get there, you'll look back and say, he held me the whole time. He held on to me through it all. I've never given up on Jesus Christ because he never gave up on me me. He's a covenant keeping God. They had a conviction that something in this nation was worth fighting for. Maybe not in their generation, but I believe some of them could look ahead. The uh, famous story, the Frenchman that came over after the war. He had been a young guy here and was instrumental in helping us win the revolution. Lafayette, I think was his name. He spoke prophetically in the early 1800s about this nation. He said, the day will come when you will save the world. It was a relative of Abraham Lincoln's secretary of war. What was his name? Stanton, Stanton, Stanton. His descendant in Europe, World War I stood at Lafayette's tomb said, we are here. You and I have to look forward to the day that Jesus Christ returns. We have to know that the fight that we're in is worth it. We have to look down the road in the generations to come and say holding on to Jesus right now is going to pay dividends later on. I don't know everything about my life. I don't know if things are, are the way they should be, if I should have done this, gone there, had that, tried this. I don't know. But what I know is he's guiding my life. And as long as I hold on to him, he's keeping covenant because that's what he does. He never breaks covenant. He'll make sure that things work out. He'll hold us securely. He'll make sure that we're victorious. He will ne no, never let our legacy be spoiled by the enemy. And one day, he will show up and he will say, I am here. Here's the third and final thing this morning. Look at, look at uh, verse 46. He even caused their captors to treat them with kindness. Save us, O oh Lord our God. Gather us back from among the nations, these nations of, uh, of drug addiction, these nations of pornography, these nations of gambling, debts, these nations of lying and deceiving. Gather us back from the nations of hypocrisy and gather us back from the nations of rage and anger. Gather us back from the nations of abuse and brokenness. Gather us back from the nations of promiscuity. Gather us back from the nations of addiction. So we can thank your holy name and rejoice and praise you, praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. Number one, identifying idols. I've, <coughs> excuse me. I've told you this before in messages in the past, but it's just critical. That I, you and I have to, we have to discern them. There's no other way. You have to discern those things. But then to get free of it, you've got to understand covenant keeping. He is a covenant keeping God and he loves to demonstrate to us his power to keep covenant. He hears our cries. Verse 44, he pitied them in their distress and he listened to their cries. The blood of Jesus Christ hears your cry and my cry. Thank God for the good news. Number three, we will be gathered gloriously. There's something powerful happening right now in the church world. It's, um, there's a gathering taking place. The church in <clears throat> Tanzania 
and uh, missionary Aaron knows about this. The church in Tanzania last year identified, and I mentioned a few weeks ago, 2033 as a 2,000-year anniversary of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know if they were the first to do it. They were the first that I heard about. But others have uh, picked up since then. I'm going to tell you, this, this feels like it is a big deal. I don't mean the Tanzanian church. I mean 2033. I mean 2,000 years since Jesus died on the cross and the Holy Spirit was poured out. (laughs) Now, we were pretty excited when it was 2,000 years since he'd been born. It seems very important. Now, I know we wanted him to return, and we were pretty sure he was going to return. And I don't want you to think that I'm trying to do the same thing again, but i got to tell you, It's only like 12 years away, and I'm pretty excited now. Listen, we're going to be gloriously gathered. No matter what you're going through, no matter what he had to bring you out of, no matter what nation you had to face down and say, I'm telling you right now, I recognize the idols of that nation, and I will not surrender. I may have to fight until Jesus comes back. I may have to give every ounce of my energy to it. I may have to pray and fast, but I will never be taken captive by this nation. I recognize the insidious nature of it. It's demonic, and it will not destroy me. It will not destroy my kids. It will not destroy my grandkids I draw the line here the blood of Jesus has set me free by faith even if you're not fully free you tell it that right now you tell listen I recognize the idols of that nation and I will not welcome you into my life any longer I belong to Jesus Christ I live for him and one of these days he's gonna gather me home wouldn't it be great if it was today hallelujah wouldn't it be great if it was today He's going to gather us. It was a promise to Israel. The psalmist is looking back over their history. If you read it, he identifies the particular places where they rebelled, and the struggle, and how they really gave Moses a difficult time. And he comes to that place of spiritually seeing the mistakes they had made. They didn't recognize how dangerous. The idols of those nations really were. When I walk, I see on these silver utility boxes downtown, these stickers all of a sudden. It says, Bill Gates evil. (laughs) Have you seen them? Like Once you see one, then you can't quit seeing them. And whoever's doing this knows that. I, I don't know where this came from. Listen, I don't think he's, he doesn't testify to being a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. But thinking that he's so smart, he's created some world dominance here. All he was doing was running around on his wife. Have you followed any of that? Now, does that equate with evil? Well, yeah, but but listen, the people who are doing that are on Facebook sharing it. Like, whoa, time out here. Look at where you are. We want to fight with flesh and blood. The Bible calls us to recognize the spiritual nature. If you can't cut off Facebook, how are you ever going to cut off your right hand? If you can't lay down YouTube, how are you ever going to pluck out your right eye? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come on, stand with me this morning. By the power of the Holy Spirit. I used to think, boy, if I was alive during the time of the Revolutionary War, boy, I'll tell you what. mm, Now I wonder which percentage I would be in. Never more than 40%. That means 60%. And on any given day, 70 or 80% of the people who lived here had two eyes and could see what was going on were against the people that we're so grateful for. Jesus said it this way to the religious leaders of his day. You decorate the tombs of those that your ancestors martyred. 
And you say, oh, had we been alive back then, we would not have done what our ancestors did. And this is what he said. By saying it, you condemn yourself. It's easy for us to think in a different day and time. We don't live in a different day and time. We live in this day and time. Amen? Thank God for America. Thank God that we can sing, God bless America. Thank God that we can say there's hope in this nation. Thank God that we can believe for a revival. Amen? There are nations where if a revival breaks out, it's got to be hidden and kept underground. But in America, if God begins to move in a powerful way in the church, hallelujah. A hundred years ago, the newspaper reporters came to the churches to report on what God was doing. I believe God can do it again. Amen? Even if we don't have a national revival, even if we don't see the people who are suddenly believing things that I never thought normal people in my country would believe, but even if we never see that, can I tell you that God still has the ability to set you and I free individually? He has the ability to break chains. He has the ability to remind us of the covenant-keeping power of Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a sinner who never met Jesus. This psalm is written about the people of God, the people who knew him, who walked with him. And he said, they did this and they did that and the other. But God, in his mercy, God, in his mercy, heard their cry. God in his mercy heard their cry. I'm going to uh, share my testimony with you someday. I've not done that in um, 40 years. But it's coming soon. I was talking to Brother Kyle Kaiser the other day, and he was talking about psychologists that one in particular has created or, or identified the law of 14. If you end up in what we as believers would call, he didn't, but what we would call bondage before you're 14, it's pretty much a life sentence. I'm here today to report that the blood of Jesus, doesn't matter if you're 14 or 44, the blood of Jesus says that's not a life sentence, amen? It's not a life sentence, hallelujah. Power of the Holy Spirit came. Bow your heads with me today, please. Father, how delighted we are that we live in the land that we do, in spite of its shortcomings, its past failures. It's still a land where people can come from any nation in the world and have hope for better opportunities, to have hope that the future generations and their family and their lineage will be blessed where people from around the world can come and begin to immediately participate in our political process and in our culture. They can begin to be promoted at work and take roles of significance in their community. It's still a land where the gospel can be preached freely. We're so grateful for that. But Lord Jesus, we're even more grateful that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of good news, the gospel of the blood is powerful. It sets the prisoners free, not just those who have never heard, not just those who are entangled and away from you, but those of us in the kingdom and us first. It is the children's bread. It belongs to us. And today we rejoice in the covenant-keeping power of the King of Glory. Hallelujah. Wonderful Jesus. Mm, glory to God. Wonderful Jesus. Somebody here this morning is beginning to believe that you're going to be set free from something that you've never been able to talk about that you've always felt held you back, kept you from achieving. You, you, faith is operating in you right now, not just because you heard some words, but because the Holy Spirit of God is giving you a gift of faith, and you are believing not the Word of God, but His Word for you. You're believing it personally. You're beginning to understand that this good news is for you, that it was a demonic trap 
that pulled you in, that it was intended to destroy you and your kids and your grandkids, but God had mercy on you because that's what he loves to do, and that's flooding your soul right now. Somebody's coming alive with the understanding that God has kept you and that God is not angry at you and that God is going to heal you and restore you, and these years are going to be greater than all the years you lost. That blessing and favor and prosperity are coming to you because the chains are breaking. The blood is coming your way and the promise of God is rising up in your heart and soul. And if that's you today, I want you to begin to thank God for him. I want you to begin to say thank you, Jesus. The psalmist said when he realized, when he recognized what was happening, he closed out that psalm by saying, praise the living God. Praise God who does such marvelous things. I believe he was saying, thank God who's done this for me. Come on, you started with God a thousand times only to fall down and you have felt the enemy's lie was the truth that there was nothing you could do to make it different you began to believe his lie that you were made that way that you were entangled and could not be set free that there was no hope for you that you'd failed God so many times there was no opportunity to come back but today there is a spark of faith a seed has been planted in your soul and you're beginning to believe differently Satan the blood of Jesus is against you Satan the blood of Jesus is against you the truth of God's Word tears down your kingdom exposes your lies and sets your prisoners free in the mighty name of Jesus we rebuke the idols of worldliness and addiction we rebuke the idols of comfort we rebuke the idols of being high being drunk we rebuke the idols of anger and rage and bitterness and unforgiveness oh hallelujah thank you Jesus glory to God thank you Lord on this July 4th for your freedom now I'm going to open this altar for, for at least 10 people and here's what I'm asking for. For those of you who have something happening in you, you just hang tight, stay where you are, that's fine. But I want 10 people who are going to come and pray for two minutes for our nation. You can pray for revival in our nation. You can pray for people to have their understanding enlightened by God. But 10 people who will come and begin to pray for something in America to happen that helps us to see a way forward, something that is positive, something that is spiritual, something that encourages us. God, visit this nation. Come on, as I pray, give me 10 people who will pray for America with all your heart. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray for our nation. We pray for America today. And we ask you to do something marvelous here. Come on, I've got five, six, seven. Go ahead, Sister Pat.